from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2020 in Europe. Of course, the event this year was supposed to be in the Netherlands. I know I was very much looking forward to going to Amsterdam. This year, of course, is going to be virtual. I'm really excited, the Cube's coverage. We've got some great members of the CNCF. We've got a bunch of end users. Uh, we've got some good thought leaders. And I'm also bringing a little bit of the Netherlands uh, to help me bring in and start uh, this keynote analysis. Happy to welcome back to the program. My co-host for the show, Yup Piskar, uh, who is an industry analyst uh, with TLA. Uh, thank you, Yup, so much for joining us. And uh, we wish we could be with you in person uh, and check out your beautiful country. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Stu. And uh, I'm still, you know, uh, a little disappointed we cannot eat the Chine Sarai Staffel together this year. Uh, yeah, can, can, can we just have a segment to explain to people the wonder that is the fusion of Indonesian food and the, the display that you get only in the Netherlands, Raj Tafel. I, I seriously had checked all over the US and Canada uh, when I was younger to find an equivalent, but one of my favorite culinary delights in the world. But We'll have to put a pin in that. Um, you, you've had some warm weather uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, recently, and you know so many of the Europeans take you know quite a lot of time off in July and August. But we're going to talk about you know some hardcore tech. You know, KubeCon, uh, you know, a show we love doing. Uh, the, the European show brings you know good diversity uh, of, of experiences and customers from across the globe. Uh, so, uh, you know, let, let's start. We did the, the keynote, uh, you know, Priyanka Sharma, the new general manager of the CNCF, uh, of course, they, they did some really smart people that come out and talk about a lot of things. Um, and since it's a foundation show, there's some news in there, but it, it's more about how they are helping corral all of these projects. Of course, the theme we've talked about for a while is, you know, KubeCon was the big discussion for many years about Kubernetes, still important, and we'll talk about that, but so many different projects and everything from the sandbox, their incubation, uh, through when they become you know, fully generally available. So I, I guess I'll, I'll let you start and step back and say, when you, you know, look at this broad ecosystem, you work with vendors, you've been from the customer side, um, you know, what, what, what's top of mind for you? What, what, what's catching your attention? So. You know, I, I guess from a uh, you know a cloud native perspective, looking at the CNCF, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. This is not about you know any individual technology. CNCF isn't about um, you know just just Kubernetes or just Prometheus or just you know service mesh. I think the added value of the CNCF and the way I look at it, at least you know looking back at my customer perspective, I would have loved to have a organization kind of curate the technology world around me for me to help me out with the decisions on a technology perspective that I needed to make to kind of move forward with my IT stack and with, you know, the requirements my customer had or my organization had to kind of move that into the next phase. And that's, you know, where, where I see the CNCF come in uh, and do their job uh, really well to help organizations, both on the vendor side as well as on the customer side, kind of take that next step, kind of see around the corner what's new, what's coming, uh, and also make sure that between different, you know, maybe even competing standards, the right ones kind of surface up and become the de facto standard for organizations to use. Yeah, uh, a lot of good thoughts there, Yup. I want to walk through that stack a little bit, but before we do, a uh, big statement that Priyanka made, I, I thought it was a nice umbrella uh, for, for her keynote. It's a foundation of doers powering uh, end user driven open source. So as I mentioned, you know, you 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 worked at a service provider, you you've done strategies for some other, you know, large organizations. Um, what's your what's what's your thought on the role of how you know the end users engage with and contribute to open source? You know, one, one of the great findings I saw a couple of years ago is you said it went from open source being something that people did on the weekend to the sides to many End users and, of course, lots of vendors have full-time people that their jobs are to contribute and, and participate in, in the open source communities. Yeah, I, I guess that kind of signals a maturity in the market to me where organizations are investing in open source because they know they're going to get something out of it, right? So back in the day, it, it was 
not necessarily certain that if you put a lot of effort into an open source project for your own gain, for your own purposes, that that would work out. And now with the backing of the CNCF, uh, as well as so many member uh, organizations and end user organizations, I think participating in open source becomes easier because there's more of a guarantee that what you put in will, you know, kind of circulate and come out and have value for you in, you know, in a different way. Because, you know, if you're working on a service mesh, some other organization might be working on you know, Prometheus or Kubernetes or uh, another project. And, and so organizations are now kind of helping each other with the CN7 as the gatekeeper to move all of those technology stacks forward instead of everyone kind of doing it for themselves, maybe even being forced to reinvent the wheel uh, for you know some of those technology components. So let, let's walk through the stack a little bit and, and the layers that are out there. So let, let's start with Kubernetes. The, the discussion has been uh, you know, Kubernetes it won the container orchestration battles, but you know, whose Kubernetes am I going to use? For for a while, it was would it be distributions? Uh, we've seen every platform basically has you know at least one Kubernetes option built into it. So doesn't mean you're necessarily using this. Uh, before AWS had their own flavor of Kubernetes, there was you know at least 15 different ways that you could run Kubernetes on top of it. Um, but now they they have ECS, they have EKS, even things like Fargate now work with. EKS, uh, so interesting innovation and adoption there. Um, but you know, VMware baked Kubernetes into vSphere 7. Uh, you know, Red Hat, of course, with OpenShift, has thousands of customers and has great momentum. We saw SUSE buy Rancher uh, to, to help them uh, move along and make sure that they get embedded there. Uh, one, one of the startups you've, that you've worked with, SpectroCloud, uh, you know, helps play into the mix there. So th there is no shortage of options. And then from a management standpoint, companies like you know, Microsoft, Google, VMware, Red Hat, all how do I manage across clusters because it's not going to just be one Kubernetes that you're going to use. We're expecting that you're going to have multiple options out there. So um, it sure doesn't sound boring to me yet or reach full maturity, Yoop. Um, what, what, what's your take? What advice do you give to people out there when they say, hey, okay, um, I, I'm, I'm going to use Kubernetes. Uh, I, I'm using, I've got hybrid cloud or uh, I probably have a couple things. How should they be approaching that and, and, and thinking about how they uh, in, engage with Kubernetes? So that's, that's a difficult one because it can go so many different ways. Uh, just because like you say, the market is maturing. Um, which means, you know, we're, we're kind of back at um, where we kind of left off virtualization a couple of years ago, where we had managers of managers, you know, managing across different data centers, doing the multi-cloud thing before it was a cloud thing. Um, we have, you know, automation doing day two operations. I saw one of the announcements for this week will be a vendor coming out with, you know, day two operations automation to kind of help simplify that that stack. Um, uh, of Kubernetes in production. And so it, you know, it, the, the best advice I think I have is don't try to do it all yourself, right? So Kubernetes is still maturing. It is still fairly you know, open uh, in a sense that it, you, know, you, you can change everything, which makes it fairly complex to use and, and configure. Um, so don't, you know, don't try and do that part yourself necessarily. Uh, either use a managed service, which there are a bunch of Spectral Cloud, for example, uh, as well as you know Platform Nine. Even the bigger players are now uh, having those those platforms, um, because you know in the end Kubernetes is kind of the foundation of what you're going to do on top of it. Kubernetes itself doesn't have business value in that sense. So spending a lot of time, especially at the beginning of a project, figuring that part out, I don't think makes sense, especially if the risk and the impact of making mistakes is fairly large. Right? Make a mistake in a monitoring product and you'll be you know, able to fix that problem more easily. Uh, but make a, a mistake in, in a Kubernetes platform and that's much more difficult, especially because I see organizations kind of build one, kind of one cluster to rule them all uh, instead of leveraging what the cloud offers, which is you know, just spin up another cluster. Um, even spin it up somewhere else because we can now do the multi-cloud thing. We can now manage applications across Kubernetes clusters. We can manage many different clusters uh, from a single pane of glass. So there's really no way or no reason anymore to kind of see uh, that 
that Kubernetes thing as something really difficult that you have to do yourself. Hence, just do it once. Instead, my recommendation would be to look at your processes and figure out how can I figure out how to, um, you know, have a Kubernetes cluster for everything I do. Maybe that's per team, maybe that's per application or per environment, per cloud, and then kind of work from that. Because again, Kubernetes is not the holy grail. It's not the end state. It is a means to an end to get where we're going with applications, with developing new functionality for uh, for customers. Well, well, you, I think you hit on a really important point. Uh, you know, the, if you if you look out in the uh, the, the social discussion, uh, sometimes you know Kubernetes and multi cloud, you know, get attacked um, because when when I talk to customers they shouldn't have a Kubernetes strategy. They have their business strategy. And there are certain things that they're trying to, you know, how do I make sure everything is secure and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, looking at DevSecOps. Um, I need to, you know, really have an edge computing strategy because that's going to help my business objectives. And when I look at some of the tools that are gonna help and get me there, well, you know, Kubernetes, the service meshes, some of the other tools in the CNCF are going to help me get there. And as you said, I've got managed services, cloud providers, uh, you know, integrators are going to help me build those solutions without me having to you know, spend years to understand how to do that. So yeah, I'd love to hear you know, any interesting projects you're hearing about, you know, edge computing, you know, security space has gone from super important to you know, even more important if that's possible in 2020. Uh, what, what are you hearing? Yeah, so the, the most interesting part for me is is definitely um, uh, the DevSecOps uh, movement, where we're basically not even allowed to call it DevOps anymore. Uh, security, you know, has finally gained a foothold. They're finally able to kind of shift left the security practices into the realm of developers, simplifying it in a way and automating it in, in a way that it's it's no longer a trivial task to integrate security. Um, and there's a lot of companies supporting that, e even from a Kubernetes perspective, integrating with Kubernetes or integrating with networking products on top of Kubernetes. Um, and I think we finally have reached the moment in time where security is no longer something that we really need to think about. Again, because the CNCF is kind of um, helping us select the right projects, helping us in the right direction, so that making choices in in the security realm becomes easier uh, and becomes a no-brainer for teams, both the security teams as well as the application development teams to uh, to integrate security. Well, you, you uh, I, 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 I'm glad to hear we've solved security. We can all go home now. Uh, that, that's awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, you know, it's such an important piece. Lots of companies, uh, you know, spending time on there, and it. it, it does feel that we are starting to get the, the process and organization around uh, so that we can attack the, 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 these challenges a little bit more uh, head on. Um, uh, how about service mesh? Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that's been a little bit contentious the last couple of years. Of course, a, ahead of the show, uh, the, you know, Google is not donating Istio uh, to the foundation. Instead, you know, well, the trademark's open. Um, I, I, I'm going to have an interview with Liz Rice to dig into that piece. Um, in the ever, you know, the, the, the chess moves, uh, Microsoft is now putting out a, a service mesh. Uh, so uh, as Corey Quinn says, you know, the, the plural of service mesh must be service meeches. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it feels like Mr. Meeseeks, for any Rick and Morty fans, we, we just keep pressing the button and more of them appear, uh, which might cause us more trouble. But. Um, What's your take? Uh, do you have a service mesh coming out? Uh, Kelsey Hightower, uh, you know, had a fun little thing on on, on Twitter about it. Uh, you know, what, what, what's the state of the state? Yeah, so I won't be publishing a service mesh. Um, maybe I'll try and recall someone, but uh, we'll we'll see what happens. But service meshes are um, they're still a hot topic. Um, it's still one of the spaces that's you know where where most discussion uh, is kind of geared towards. Um, there is yet to form a single standard. There is yet a kind of a single block of companies uh, creating a front to kind of solve that service mesh issue. And I think that's because in the end, service meshes are from a complexity uh, perspective, um, they're, they're not mature enough to be able to kind of commoditize into a standard. But I think we still need a, a little while. Um, and maybe ask me this question next year again, and, and we'll see what happens. 
but we'll still need a little while to kind of let this market shift and let this market innovate because I don't think we've reached the end state with service meshes. Um, also kind of gauging from customer interest and, and actual production implementations. I don't think this has trickled down from, you know, the largest companies that have the most requirements into kind of the smaller companies, the smaller markets, which, you know, is something that we do usually see. Now Kubernetes is definitely doing that. So in, th in terms of service meshes, I don't, I don't think the, you know, the innovation um, it has, has reached that endpoint yet. And I think we'll still need a little while, which, you know, will mean for the upcoming period that we'll kind of see this head to head form from different companies trying to gain a foothold, trying to lead the market, uh, introduce their own products. And I think that's okay. And I think the, th the CNCF will continue to kind of curate that experience. Um, up to a point where, you know, maybe somewhere in the future, we will have a, a non-competing standard uh, to, uh, to finally make, you know, finally have something that's commoditized and easy to implement. Yeah, uh, you know, it's an interesting piece. One of the things I've always enjoyed when I go to the show is you just wander and the things you bump into are like, oh my gosh, wow, look at all of these cool little projects. Um, I don't think we are going to stop that Cambrian explosion of innovation and ideas. Um, you know, when you go walk around, there's over usually over 200 vendors there, and a lot of them are open source projects. Now, I would say many of them, when you have a discussion with them, I'm not sure that there's necessarily a business behind that project. Um, and that's where you also see you see maturity in spaces. Uh, a year or so ago, uh, in the observability space, uh, open tracing helped pull together a couple of pieces. Uh, storage is starting to mature. Doesn't mean we're going to get down to one standard. Uh, there's still a couple of storage engines out there. I have some really good discussions, uh, you know, this week to, to go into that. But it goes from, boy, storage is a mess, to, oh, okay, we have a couple of uses. Um, and just like storage in the data center, there's not, you know, a box or a protocol to do anything. It's what's your use case, what performance, you know, what clouds, you know, what environments are you living on, and therefore you can do that. So it's good to see lots of new things added, but then they, they mature out and they consolidate. And, and as you said, the, the CNCF is help giving those roadmaps, those maps, the, the landscapes, which, boy, if you go online, they have some really good tools. You know, go to CNCF, uh, the, the website, uh, the, the, and, and you can look through, um, you know, Cheryl Hung uh, put one, uh, I'm trying to remember which, it, it was, it's basically like a bullseye of the ones that, you know, here's the one that's fully baked, and here's the ones that are making its way through, and the, the customer feedback, and they're gonna do more of those to help give guidance, uh, because no one solution, uh, is going to fit everybody's needs, and you, you know you, you have these spectrums of offering. You, you know, wild card for you. Are there any you know interesting projects out there? Um, you know, new things that you're hearing about. Uh, you know, what 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 areas should people be poking around uh, that might not be you know the the top level big things? So, I guess for me, and that you know that's really personal because I'm still kind of. Uh, a, an infrastructure uh, a geek in, in that sense. So one of the things that really surprised me was a you know, a more traditional vendor, uh, uh, Zerto in this case, with a fantastic uh, solution. Finally, they're doing data protection for Kubernetes. And my recommendation would be to look at you know companies like Zerto in the data protection space, finally making that move into you know containers because you know, even though we've kind of had, you know, we've completed the discussion stateful versus stateless, there's still, you know, a lot to be said for thinking about data protection if you're going to go all in into containers and into Kubernetes. So that was one that, that really uh, provoked my my thought. Right, I, I really uh, was interested in, in seeing, okay, what's, what's Zerto doing in this list of CNCF members? And, you know, for, for that matter, I think other vendors like VMware like Red Hat, like um, you know, other companies that are kind of moving into this space with a regained trust in their solutions is is something that I think is really interesting and, and absolutely worth exploring during the event to see what those more traditional companies, uh, to, to use a term, are, are doing to innovate with their solutions and kind of helping the CNCF and the cloud native world become, become more enterprise ready. And, and that's kind of the point I'm, I'm trying to make where, you know, we, for the longest time, we've had this cloud native versus traditional, but I always thought of it like cloud native versus enterprise ready, 
or proven technology. This is kind of for the developers doing a new thing. This is for you know the IT operations teams. And, and we're kind of seeing those two groups, uh, at least from a technology perspective, being fused into kind of one new blood group, um, making their way forward and kind of innovating with those technologies. So I, I think it's interesting to look at the, the existing vendors and the CNCF members to see where they're innovating. Well, you you you, uh, you, you connected a, a dotted line between uh, the Cloud Native Insights uh, program that I've been doing. You were actually my first guest on, on that. Um, we, we've got uh, a couple of months worth of episodes out there, and it is uh, the, the closing that gap between what the developers are doing and what the enterprise was. So, absolutely, there's architectural pieces. You like you, you know, I'm an infrastructure geek, so I'd come from those pieces, and there was that gap between, you know. I'm going to use, you know, I use VMs and now I'm using containers and I'm looking at things like serverless to, you know, how do we build applications? And is it that bottom up versus top down? And it, what do companies need? They need to be able to react fast. They need to be able to change along the way. They need to be able to take advantage of the innovation that ecosystems like this have. So um, I, I love the emphasis that the CNCF has making sure that the end users are going to have a strong voice because, as you said, the big companies who've come in, not just you know, VMware and Red Hat, but you know, IBM and Dell are behind those two companies, uh, and you know, HPE, you know, Cisco, you know, many others out there that, you know, the, the behemoths out there, not to mention, of course, the big hybrid cloud, the, the big hyperscale clouds that help start this. You know, we wouldn't have a lot of this without Google kicking off with, with Kubernetes, AWS front and center, and an active participant here. And if you talk to the customers there, they're all leveraging it. Uh, and, and of course, Microsoft. So it is a robust, big ecosystem. You, thank you so much for helping us dig into it. Uh, definitely hope uh, we, we can have events uh, back in, in the Netherlands in the near future. And uh, great to see you as always. Thanks for having me. All right, stay tuned. We have, as I said, full spectrum of interviews from theCUBE. They'll be broadcasting during the three days. And of course, go to thecube.net uh, to catch all of what we've done uh, this year at the show, as well as all the back history. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm at Stu on Twitter. And thank you, as always, for watching theCUBE.